By February of 79, the first police album was headed for a top 30 breakthrough in America. We hadn't really broken the world open yet, but we were just about to, we could feel it, we could smell it, we, we knew that we were onto something. In the spring of 79, two years after they began as a struggling London punk band, the police struck gold with the re-release of a single that went nowhere the year before. Ah! Roxanne seduced the public her second time around. The first in a phenomenal six-year string of top 40 hits by the police. 27-year-old Sting was now the most exciting new voice in rock. He was also getting additional media attention for his featured role in the film Quadrophenia. That was sort of the beginning of him being sort of pulled out as a sort of separate entity to the police. But at the same time, it just also raised the profile of the band. That fall, their second album hit the U.S. Top 25. The police were beginning to dominate rock's new wave. I got good news and bad news. Stuart Copeland and Andy Summers confronted the fact that Sting was starting to dominate the police. They started homing in on Sting as the face. And Sting was just one hell of a good-looking pop star. We were jealous, we were, you know, envious and all that at the same time as we knew that this was very good for us. By the spring of 1980, it looked like the new decade might belong to the police. That is, if they could hold their combustible trio of egos together. They were constantly doing this push-pull thing of admiring each other and trying to cut off each other at the knees at the same time. That could not continue. In March of 80, the fractious police family embarked on their first world tour. It was a bold move for a band that had been on the charts less than a year. Police toured the world long before they were a world-class act. Let's go and play in Egypt. Let's go and play in India. Let's go and play in Hong Kong. <laughs> no one was doing that. I got them all on horses and camels galloping across the pyramids in the background, and I sent those photos back to London. Fascinating, huh? Their world tour raised their profile. But it was their third album that made the police superstars, hitting the U.S. top ten in the fall of 80. Suddenly you're like the biggest thing in the world, and uh, there's a lot of sort of psychosis that goes with that. When you're the goose that lays the golden eggs, people treat you like a goose, or actually more like a four-year-old child. And four-year-olds slap each other around occasionally. You know, I mean, it sort of gets into spinal tap realms, it gets a little psychotic. Die! There would often be tension building up during the set. You could feel Stuart may be resenting, oh, now we're going into another one of Sting's long-winded songs, and Sting was resenting the fact that Stuart was overplaying, and if Andy played more than eight bars of a solo, Sting would give him that, that look. The truly wounding battles, where we had plenty of time to consider, in cold blood, the best way to hurt each other, uh, that was in the studio. There is no political solution. Stuart, Andy, and Sting recorded their fourth album in the summer of 81. It was co-producer Hugh Padgham's first experience with the police. All three guys were quite competitive, and that, that surprised me, but I think it gave it a, a certain energy, for sure. I remember getting a call from Hugh Padgham saying, I can't work in the studio anymore. They're just arguing, and there's all kinds of problems. The usual battles, but nothing catastrophic. With the Ghost and the Machine, the writing was on the wall that this was going to be the end of the police. Sting really came out as the dominant composer. I don't know how much we would have dared to articulate to one another, but Sting definitely was assuming all the control. The big hit on the album was uh, Every Little Thinks He Does His Magic. The rest of the album was fairly dark. But we needed a chink of light. <laughs> By January 81, Ghost in the Machine was the number two album in America. During this time of emotional turmoil, Sting, Andy, and Stewart 
went into the studio to record their fifth album. By that time, it felt to me that it was Sting's band. He wrote all bar two songs on the record, and he had a good idea of how he wanted them to be. He comes in with a fully produced demo track, which sounds like the record ought to sound, and I just had to put my mark on it, and that became the battle. What happened was that creative friction crossed a line and it got toxic. It got personal. There was a, a knot in the, like this in the middle of the recording, and uh, but we got through it and we went on and we finished the album. After the turbulent synchronicity sessions, Andy recorded an album with King Crimson's Robert Fripp, and Stewart finished the musical score for Francis Ford Coppola's film Rumblefish. Just mention of anything to do with the police made me break out into a cold shakes. But going on the road, of course, we knew how to be a band on stage. So let's go! We'd go on stage and we'd kick ass, and there was just nothing better than that. By July of 83, Andy Stewart and Sting were back on stage as Synchronicity topped the U.S. album charts for the first of 17 record-breaking weeks. What the Beatles were in the 60s, what Led Zeppelin was in the 70s, police were in 1983. They were the biggest band in the world. Well, I was with them on the Synchronicity tour, Andy Summers, I remember being a clown, and he and Sting and Stewart had this sort of a uh, real brotherly love-hate relationship. I tell you what, should we film me whooping Sting? Yes, that would be good. Wouldn't that it? would wouldn't be great. <laughs> we were in this state where any little incident would turn into World War III. Sting would come off uh, from the show very angry, usually uh, shouting and not being happy with how it had gone. I'd like to advertise for a new band, please. It was like a marriage that was over. One of the most painful things that Sting experienced was the breakup of his first marriage. And in some ways, the smarter part of him said, let's just end this clean now before breaking up will be so painful that none of us may survive it. That summer, the police were sent to play before a sellout crowd at New York's Shea Stadium. Sting was sort of hinting that this was going to be the last tour and he was sort of starting to come out and say that this was the moment to stop and uh, part of me just kind of went along with it. Andy at the time was with me. He, he really understood where I was coming from here and he agreed. I'm not sure how Stuart felt. I certainly didn't feel that way. I thought this is great. I can carry on doing this. I love this. Is, this is fun. I like this. On August 18th, 1983, nearly two decades after the Beatles made history there, the police rock Shea Stadium. It all came together that night. It just doesn't get any better than that. But I think also the band realized, with all the tension there, that there was no place else to go. Three people had different ideas of where they wanted to go with their music and their lives. From that high vantage point, everything else looked real easy and Sting thought that he could be a great actor, Andy thought that he would be able to pursue any career he wanted in the world of the guitar, and I was into film music. And it's the arrogance that comes from that kind of success, combined with the fact that we really had this feeling that the police was a golden cage. So we had to melt down the golden cage. In February of 1984, Every Breath You Take won the Grammy for Song of the Year. That same month in Australia, the police took their final bows. And that was suddenly like, you know, I think I felt like I walked off the edge of a cliff. We weren't the band anymore, although no one knew it. It was a very bizarre time. The police have broken up. Can you confirm that? It's outrageous. I wonder if it's true. I don't know. Is it true? Are the police breaking up? No. There was never an official announcement the police had broken up, goodbye. Miles wanted to sort of keep this myth going that the band was still around. It was ridiculous. We weren't. By the end of the year, Sting was making musical plans of his own.
And in February of 85, he made his solo debut in New York City. Andy and Stewart happened to be in town, and I said, guys, how do you feel about this solo project that he's doing? And Stewart said, hey, there's only one asshole who doesn't want to continue the police, and he ain't sitting at this table. Hey. 